The last story that my great-grandfather told me before he passed away was in fact my favorite. Every time my, gran my parents and I would go visit him, he always had a different story for me. Either something about his life or about a historical event he lived through. Whether it was his travels around America during the Great Depression, the counterculture movement in the 1960s, or the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, they always packed a different punch. But it was his last story that was different. He told the story with the same sense of naivety in his voice that he experienced that night in Miami in 19 1933. He started by asking if I knew who Giuseppe Zingara was. I shook my head and said no. I had no idea where he was going, like always. He told me that on February 15, 1933, along with his parents, they spent the day at the beach in Miami. They parked their car in the northeast corner of Bayfront Park in downtown Miami. The traffic in the morning was bad, so they decided to stay at the beach a little bit longer than planned. After dinner, they walked through the park back to their car, and a large gathering was beginning to take shape around an open touring car. They asked someone why there were so many people gathering in the park. My first thought was that it was a Ku Klux Klan rally, but someone clarified that President-elect Franklin D. Roosevelt was delivering a speech, and our unified opposition of the President-elect forced us to stay and hear what he had to say, he told me. But it was once FDR had concluded that Zingara came into the story. Out of nowhere, six loud rounds fired toward the front and chaos ensued. We hit the ground like many in the crowd. Some ran, some just stood, some just stood there in shock. I was horrified. Five people were hit, including Roosevelt, and the mayor of Chicago was killed. Zingara, an unemployed bricklayer, shouted, Too many people are starving before firing. Unfortunately for Zingara, he stood only five feet tall and needed a stool to see over the crowd to fire. The stool that he chose was wobbling, and that contributed to the failed assassination attempt. Several people in the crowd attacked Zingara. Roosevelt, with a bullet in his guts, pleaded to the crowd to stop beating the man and let the authorities take justice. Zingara was originally charged with attempted murder, but when the mayor of Chicago eventually died from his wounds, the charge was changed to second-degree murder. Zingara was given the electric chair. The reason this story will always remain my favorite is not because of the events that happened that night, but what didn't happen. My great-grandfather and probably everybody else in Bayfront Park didn't know that the future of the United States was, for just maybe a split second, in the hands of a deranged, five-foot-tall man standing on a wobbly stool. If Zingara was successful, Roosevelt's running mate, John Nance Garner, a Southern Democrat, would have been sworn in instead. Garner opposed any legislation with socialistic leanings, so in turn this meant Roosevelt's highly socialistic and highly influential pack of legislation known as the New Deal, which was a large part of the platform that he ran and, was and won the presidential election on, would have been scrapped. The New Deal was the saving grace of the United States, he always told me. My grandfather's admiration for the President Roosevelt grew over the course of the Depression while traveling the country and seeing the implications of the, new, of the New Deal. The reason this was his favorite memory was because it took over 25 years to fully grasp the implications this event would have had on world history if Giuseppe Zingar would have successfully assassinated Franklin Roosevelt in Miami and John Nance Garner sworn in as the 32nd President. The United States most likely doesn't survive the Great Depression.